Hi, my name is Peter Tran. I'm going to be talking about improving deep learning on the prediction of drug-induced liver injury. This is a project by my peers and I, Dave, John, Stephen, and our professor, Dr. Ted Ahn. We're in the program of bioinformatics and computational biology at St. Louis University. So let's jump into it. As you're probably well aware, um, the drug development timeline is a long one. Um, drugs often tend to fail later on in the process. So there was a way for us to computationally determine the safety of a drug much earlier on in the timeline. We could save a lot of time and money. And so this came to challenge tackles that from the perspective of drug-induced liver injury, or more commonly known as DILI. Let's look at some previous um, attempts at predicting DILI. Um, the first two that we have here are from the previous iteration of the Scamda challenge. Um, this last one here by Zhu et al. is not from a Cambda challenge, but a separate attempt at predicting DILI primarily from chemical descriptors. So the first thing that's important to know is that um, we're using MCC as the metric here, Matthews Correlation Coefficient. Um, if you're not aware, it uses the full confusion matrix. And it's great for evaluating performance on imbalanced data, which is the case here. So what we found in the previous attempts of the CAMDA challenge is that it doesn't perform too great. Um, some models are able to perform well under cross-validation, such as random uh, forest. However, then they tend to overfit and not perform well on the holdout validation data. The thing that really piqued our interest, however, is that deep learning has been used to successfully predict DILI um, with Zoo et al. on their separate data set. However, um, on the previous iteration of the CAMDA challenge, deep learning was not used to great effect. Um, and so we wanted to kind of bridge that gap and see if there's any way we can improve that work. So let's talk a little bit about the background on the data that we're given for this challenge. So we have four targets that we're trying to predict. DILI1, which is whether or not the DILI score was six or greater on this compound. DILI3 was whether or not the compound had a warning or it was withdrawn. DILI5 is whether or not it was assigned a DILI endpoint of one. DILI6 was whether or not it was assigned a DILI endpoint of two. And so this is the predictor data down here that we're given to work with. These six green ones in the middle are um, different cell lines and their L1000 expression data. L1000 is a small subset of the human transcriptome that's supposed to be a very good um, indicator of the full human transcriptome. And then so other than those, we also have mold 2 chemical descriptors. We have host factor information from the FDA FIERS database, which is like demographics. And we also have toxicology um, data. One thing that's important to note is that not all of these predictors have the same number of observations with them <clears throat> for the same number of compounds. Some of them do have the full 617 um, for all the compounds. However, some, such as some expression data, do not have the full 617. So that's something that's important to note that we'll discuss. Another thing that's important to note is this year's challenge includes a lot more than the previous year or the previous iteration. The previous iteration only had one daily variable that you're trying to predict and only had two cell lines, MCF7 and the PC3 cell lines that they were working with. The first question that we had upon given this data is how useful is this new data that we're giving this iteration compared to the previous one? So the way we decided to do that was to calculate the point by serial correlation coefficients. And that's just uh, gives you a way to measure the relationship between a binary variable and a continuous one. And so what we did was we calculated this coefficient for each variable against DILI1 for simplicity. Um, and then we used a p-value of 0.05 as cutoff to determine whether or not it was um, significant. And so this table right here displays those results. And in general, what we seem to find is that the cell expression data is definitely the most important when it comes to predicting at least DILI1. Um, one thing that's really important to note that kind of surprised us was um, the multi chemical descriptors only had nine out of 778 variables that were considered significant based on our criteria. We thought that's interesting because, um, like I mentioned earlier, by that study with Zoo et al., they used chemical descriptors in MOLT2 in particular um, to great effect. However, that's not being seen here, which is interesting and something that warrants further investigation. Okay, so now that we kind of got a basic idea of what the data looked like and what was useful, we wanted to get a, 
uh, establish a basic baseline for um, performance. So what we decided to do was cast a really wide net of models um, at the data to kind of get a basic idea of performance to compare against when we dove into the deep learning a little bit more. And so what we have here are baseline MCCs with tenfold cross-validation across 22 different models. Each of these models are using MCF7 cell line as the um, training data set. We selected that because it was the one with the most number of significant variables that were correlated significantly with daily one. One thing that's very important to note is that each of these models um, were only used with the default parameters in the sklearn package. We weren't trying to find what was the absolute best model here. We just want to get a rough idea of performance. So, um, and these results that we're getting are fairly consistent with previous work in the literature. We're seeing some models that have median MCCs between negative 0.1 and negative 0.2. So they're not too great, but again, they're somewhat comparable to previous results, and it gives us an idea of what we're working with and something to compare against moving forward. So with that in mind, we went on to develop many different machine learning models or deep learning models, and a little bit over 40 models were considered. And so let's talk a little bit about what we learned in that process. <clears throat> So one of the primary things we were concerned with was overfitting the data. This is something that you've seen um, affect previous results greatly. Um, many models would perform well under cross-validation. However, when they're applied to the test data, um, it didn't really generalize that well. And that's something that we noticed affected us very much. So we have two loss curves that are plotted here. <clears throat> On the left is an earlier model that we developed in our process, and this looks like a lot of our early models. Um, with this blue line, what you have is the training um, loss, and the orange line is the validation loss. And what we can see is that the training loss does decrease over time and probably will continue to do so. Good. The validation loss, on the other hand, decreases a little bit, but then doesn't as we continue to train. That means it's overfitting. This is a model that didn't really have much regularization going on. It only had 50% um, dropout layers in between each linear layer, which is commonly recommended in the literature. So upon seeing that and working with a lot of other models that had similar results, we decided to try many different techniques of regularization and many different combinations of such techniques. And here's what we found works the best. This is our best model currently that we have. Um, you can see that the training and validation curves look a lot nicer. They're a lot more similar, and this is what we like to see. This is a model that has really high dropout. What I mean by that is that before the input layer, we have a 20% dropout layer, and then after each linear layer, we have a 70% dropout layer, which is really high, um, but that works really well on our data in our case. Another thing it has is L2, or bridge regression regularization, uh, which seems to work really well. So that's good. Regularization is great. What else worked well? Feature selection. So before I kind of jump into this and talk about feature selection, I wanted to talk really quick about the different predictors. We um, tested our deep learning models on all of the different predictors and combinations of those as well. However, what we've seen that works the best are really just two of them, MCF7 and the PC3 cell lines. MCF7 notated as P7 here, and the PC3 cell line notated as P8. And we hypothesize this is the case for two different reasons. The first one is because, as we noticed earlier, the cell expression data was the most important when it came to predicting daily. The second thing that was really important is amongst those um, cell line expression data, um, the MCF7 and the PC3 cell lines were the ones with the most observations. They had the most data. And when it comes to machine learning, and especially deep learning, um, the more data you have, the better. And so that's what we have here. Um, and we're generally noticing that between these two, they kind of go back and forth, but P8 seems to perform the best. And that's especially the case when it comes to DILI3, which was what we decided to really focus on. And so let's jump over to this graph on the right, which really just focuses on the um, PC3 cell line and our best model's performance on that. And so what we have is the blue ones um, are the model with feature selection, and the orange ones are the models without feature selection. And so when I say feature selection, what that means is um, 
we are using the point by serial correlation coefficients that we discussed earlier, and we're calculating the correlation between um, each variable and uh, dilly one, three, five, and six. And then we use the p-value cutoff of 0.05 um, to select which variables were important, were significant, and we combine them all together um, between the different dillies with no overlap or no duplicate. <clears throat> and that would be the data set we used. It's important to note that you should do this during um, cross-validation, and you should do it on your training folds. So in this case, we're doing this on our four training folds, not on our one testing fold. And so that's what we're showing here, the results of that. And what we're seeing is, in general, it seems like um, feature selection improves the results. So and with DILI1, it does improve the result a little bit, however, it increases the variance as well, so there's some give or take. DILI3, however, keeps the distribution mostly the same, however, it just moves up the result by a fairly um, good amount, which is really, really cool. Um, with DILI5 and DILI6, it doesn't really change it a whole lot. Um, so that's really cool, and that alone seems to warrant further investigation with the usage of deep learning with um, predicting at least DILI3. So let's look at this data a little bit more. Um, right here, we have our cross-validation results, which is the exact same thing that you saw plotted on the previous slide, however, this is with numbers. Again, with DILI1, it didn't seem to perform that well with 0.041 um, MCC medium. DILI3, however, it does have some predictive power with 0.255 MCC plus or minus 0.041 um, standard deviation. So it's not fantastic, but it's certainly munching on to something, and that gives us um, some hope that it has some power here and warrants further investigation. DILI5 and DILI6, not too great either. Um, not really much more than random. Okay, so that's cool and all, but how well does this perform on our holdout test data is the real question. So with DILI1, 5, and 6, it doesn't really seem to change at all. It performs bad, but it did before, so it's not that exciting. DILI3, on the other hand, is a little bit more interesting. Um, it performs a little bit worse at 0.099 MCC. Um, however, it doesn't um, completely lose its predictive power. Um, and this is interesting compared to previous results that we've seen where the predictive power was completely lost, more or less. Um, so our regularization is working somewhat, however we still are overfitting, and which is interesting considering how much on the regularization that we are doing. Um, so that warrants some further investigation with some future work, we want to even ramp that up a lot more. And so what we have here on the right is just our model architecture for those that are interested. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what we learned. Um, in conclusion, deep learning is really tough when you don't have a lot of data. Um, and even machine learning is really tough when you don't have a lot of data, as we've seen from previous work. When our press predictors have only roughly 600 observations, that's really not a lot to go off of. And that explains a lot of the overfitting that we're seeing. So um, while our result is still valuable, um, we really believe that it might be more fruitful to explore techniques for reducing overfitting on classical models instead, especially when deep learning is very prone to overfit. However, that's true for other models as well. So that's one of the biggest, most important things to keep in mind. And speaking of regularization, where we can't stress enough how important that has been for this project in improving our loss curves um, between the generous amounts of dropout layers that we're using in kernel regularization uh, we were able to tidy up our loss curves a lot. And even though we still overfit on our test data, it maintains um, some predictive power, which is fantastic. Feature selection, that's something that also really, really helped us a lot. And that's definitely true in the case of DILI3. Um, so any future work on this challenge, I definitely recommend investigating the use of feature selection. <clears throat> it's not very often do you have something that can improve performance on Atari by almost 2.5 times, which is in the case of DILI3 here. So um, here are further directions that we want to investigate before um, the full paper submission. One of the things that we're really interested in is possibly applying transfer learning here. Um, with a very small amount of data in this data set, relatively speaking, um, maybe we could try and find another source of data to train on and then do some transfer learning to see how well that performs here. 
a good start is that study by Zhu et al. that I mentioned earlier. Um, they use chemical descriptors, like I mentioned, um, and in particular, they also are using mold 2 chemical descriptors, which we also have here. So that might be a great start to try. Um, speaking of mold 2 chemical descriptors, again, that was used to great effect before with deep learning. Um, we're not really doing anything too interesting with mold 2 right now, but perhaps with some chemical expertise, we could do some feature engineering that might be useful um, in this challenge. Another thing that we could do is maybe some data pre-processing. Um, we're not really doing much pre-processing at all with this data. We're kind of just taking what's given us by Canada organizers and running with it, um, which they did pre-process the data already. But um, when it comes to machine learning, a lot of times how you pre-process your data really can change the performance um, of your models. So that's something that we could look into as well, is doing pre-processing ourselves in our own way. Um, and lastly, we want to investigate further different techniques for class, class balancing. Sorry. Um, we're using the Keras package, which has a built-in way for um, weighting the different classes during training which works, um, but it's, it's, there's much more techniques that we can try out there. And we've seen from, from previous results that class, um, or tackling the issue of class balancing really can improve results quite significantly. And so that's something that um, we should investigate different techniques for as well. So that's all we have. I want to say a few thanks um, to our great team at SLU. Um, it's been great working with you guys. I wanted to also say thanks for the Canada organizers for putting our, together this challenge. That was fun to work with and learn a lot on. Um, and the Canada reviewers for providing us a lot of feedback for how to improve what we've done. And I also want to say thanks to the ISMB um, 2020 Fellowship that was awarded to our students, which helps us be here. Thank you very much.